The topic of tonight's presentation is going to be hip and knee replacement, and the presentation is titled Everything You Want to Know About Hip and Knee Replacement. I'll start off by saying that I have no financial or other conflicts of interest to declare. The objective of the presentation is to talk about some topics related to hip and knee replacement that patients frequently ask in the clinic. We'll discuss a few of the things that I think patients should know if they're considering hip and knee replacement, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end for anything that isn't answered. So, for some background information, joint replacement surgery is one of the most common elective surgical procedures that's performed across the world and in the USA. These numbers specifically up top are from 2014, and in that year there were an estimated uh, 680,000 total knee replacements and 370 total hip replacements. These numbers are anticipated to increase as we move forward, and below you see projected numbers for 2030, and they're expecting that there will be over 1.2 million total knee replacements and 600,000 total hip replacements done in the USA. Why is joint replacement so common? Well, to, for starters, we do have an aging population. People are living longer, they're remaining more active into their older years and arthritis of the hip and knee is very common. About half of people will have arthritis in at least one knee during their lifetime and about a quarter of people will have arthritis of the hip. With joint replacement, there are excellent outcomes and that refers to both pain relief and improvements in quality of life that are associated with these surgeries. In terms of our average patient, 65 is the average age for a knee replacement and 66 is roughly the average age for a hip replacement. There are no absolute age limits and a lot of the decision making for surgery is dependent on patient activity level, their overall health status and other factors. So when is joint replacement surgery necessary? Hip and knee replacements are indicated for the treatment of end-stage arthritis when non-surgical measures have failed. So we always try non-surgical things first, but when there aren't any other options, then we move to surgery. It is important to discuss exactly what arthritis is so that people have an understanding of what we're talking about. Arthritis is joint inflammation and degeneration, and the hallmark is thinning of the cartilage joint surface. Eventually, when all of the cartilage is worn out, we have a situation where there is bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Symptoms of arthritis include pain, swelling, stiffness, loss of range of motion. The most common form of arthritis is osteoarthritis, which is commonly referred to as wear and tear arthritis. Now there are many other forms that do exist, including post-traumatic arthritis, which occurs after somebody has had a significant injury involving a joint, such as a fracture. Rheumatoid arthritis is the most common type of inflammatory arthritis, and there are many, many other forms of inflammatory arthritis that exist. The typical findings of osteoarthritis that we see on x-ray are shown in the picture here. We have an arthritic hip that's on the left and a normal hip that you see on the right side of the picture. The hallmarks are joint space narrowing, so we can see in the normal hip that the bone shows up white. The space in between the bone in the hip is the cartilage, and once the cartilage is worn out completely, there's no more space evident, which we see on the arthritic side. In addition, we see bone that forms outside of the margins of the normal joint, which are referred to as bone spurs, or osteophytes is the more technical term. We also see cysts in the area of bone just adjacent to the hip, so those are areas where it looks like there are little cavities or areas where there isn't bone. And then there's sclerosis, where dense bone forms adjacent to the joint as well. Things look more white directly around the joint in the arthritic hip. So this applies to arthritis in the hip, in the knee, in the shoulder, elsewhere through the body, that these are the typical changes and findings that we would see. Again, a normal hip, next to an arthritic hip, and we can see where the joint space is worn out. There's a lot of that sclerotic white appearance. There's cysts or little holes that appear adjacent to the arthritic joint and um, the bone spurs as well. Again, we see these changes in the knee. In the knee, it's quite common that one side or one compartment of the knee will wear out sooner than the other. So in this specific example, you can see that the narrowing is much worse on the inside of the knee, further to the right. And then again, we see those other typical changes. Now, when we are looking at x-rays in a person who has arthritis, it's important to take into consideration that the x-ray findings do not always correlate with symptoms. What this means is that some people will have very advanced changes 
on their x-ray and only have minimal symptoms. And vice versa is also true. Sometimes people will have very significant symptoms and debilitating pain despite having milder changes on their x-rays. So the x-rays alone don't tell us the whole story. They don't tell us when surgery is necessary. And for this reason, it's important to have a discussion with your physician in terms of how debilitating your pain is, what sort of symptoms that you're experiencing, and what treatment modalities that you've tried in terms of non-operative things before making a decision as to whether it's time for uh, joint replacement surgery. So talking about the non-operative treatment first, followed by surgical treatment for arthritis. Non-surgical treatment involves weight loss, which can actually be very significant in terms of the amount of pain that people experience. When people are walking, going through a normal gait cycle, approximately three times of their weight is transmitted through both the knee and the hip, and that's just with normal walking. When people are doing more athletic activities, that amount of force that's seen by the joint increases greatly. By the same logic, if we can decrease a person's weight by one pound, three less pounds are seen at the joint. So anybody who is overweight or has an above average weight and arthritis of the hip or knee, uh, they would benefit from losing weight both with regards to their symptoms and as we'll discuss later in terms of the risks of surgery if we do move in that direction. Activity modification can be helpful. Once arthritis develops in the joint and the joint surfaces are not smooth and normal, high impact activities can be very aggravating and irritating to that joint. So things that include running and jumping are less advisable than activities that people can use to keep fit and active, such as cycling, getting in a pool, elliptical, where there's much less impact involved. Physical therapy can be very useful and has been shown to uh, provide improvements in patients' pain. This is by increasing the muscle uh, mass and strength across the joint, which can help to stabilize things, but also to maintain range of motion as stiffness can become problematic and is not always correctable with joint replacement surgery. Moving down the list, braces can be very useful, particularly in the um, scenario of the knee. As we discussed previously, knee arthritis can sometimes involve one portion or compartment of the knee more than the others, and braces can help to shift the weight through the less affected portion of the knee in some circumstances. This is less the case for the hip. Tylenol can be useful for uh, pain control as well as anti-inflammatory medications in patients who don't have any contraindication or other medical reason why they can't take those medications. We do try and avoid narcotic pain medications prior to surgery because if people are using them beforehand, they develop tolerance, these medications become less effective, and we know that the outcomes are not as good on patients who are on narcotics prior to joint replacement surgery. Moving further on down the list, for patients who are having either an acute flare of their arthritis or have tried all the above things and are still not getting effective relief, we consider injections. Corticosteroid injections are used many places in the body, including both the hip and knee. The cortisone injection serves as a potent anti-inflammatory and can help to reduce inflammation and pain that occurs in the affected joint. Lubricant injections, also sometimes referred to as visco-supplement injections, are an option for arthritis in the knee as another alternative. And then Moving down to the bottom, number two, surgical treatment. So if we've tried everything non-surgical and people are still having significant impairment in their quality of life, they're still having a significant degree of pain, then we would think about moving on to joint replacement surgery. So if we do decide that it's time for a joint replacement surgery, how is this done? Well, surgery usually takes place over approximately one and a half hours to actually perform the joint replacement. In terms of the time in hospital, we are trending towards less and less time in hospital. And younger, healthier patients who are able to get around better afterwards, who have better strength and mobility, can sometimes get out of hospital the same day as their joint replacement. More typically for other patients, people are staying one night in hospital and are often going home the next day. The criteria for going home are that patients are able to get around safely when taking into consideration the obstacles they'll have to navigate at home, that their pain control is reasonable, and that there aren't any other medical issues that would keep people in hospital. 
In terms of the anesthesia, there are many options, and this is something that's best discussed between a patient and the anesthesiologist who are taking care of them at the time of their surgery. However, the general options are, number one, general anesthetic, where patients go to sleep completely. Number two, which is sometimes combined with a general anesthetic, is spinal anesthesia. This is where a needle in the back is used with anesthetic medications in order to put the legs to sleep. Patients who don't want to see, hear, or remember anything can have sedation to the point where they're still breathing on their own but won't hear or remember anything is also a potential option. And then nerve blocks are something that has been gaining popularity recently. Again, a needle with local anesthetic, like at the dentist, is used around the nerves in the leg that provide sensation and pain control to that area of the body. And these can be very effective, both in terms of keeping the pain reasonable during the surgery, meaning less anesthetic medications are necessary, as well as after surgery when the block is still effective. And we find that patients are having less pain after surgery when uh, combinations of these are used. Talking first about the specifics of hip replacement surgery, on the left hand side we see a before picture showing a hip with arthritis and then on the right an after picture showing a hip replacement that has been performed. So how do we get from point A to point B? Well, number one, different surgeons will have slightly different techniques and this includes the use of different surgical approaches which means how we gain access to the hip. Traditionally posterior was the most common going from the back more recently, anterior has become more common where the surgical incision is in the front and going through the muscles uh, in the front of the hip. And then lateral is another option that's available. The specific approach that your surgeon uses is likely what they're comfortable with. And it is important if this is something that matters to you specifically as a patient that you have this discussion with your surgeon beforehand. Implants from different manufacturers are common and in general most manufacturers will have roughly equivalent implants that serve similar purposes for specific uh, issues that a surgeon might be trying to address. However, there does not seem to be one specific implant or manufacturer that has been proven to be better than the others. So again, these are all very good options. Uh, dependent on what your surgeon is comfortable with and generally likes to use. And similarly, there have been different implant materials that people have discussed in the past. We'll discuss what's most common currently. However, when we talk about the specific materials that things are made of, uh, there are some alternatives that you may read about online or elsewhere. So again, most common materials and what we're using currently, what I use, um, the parts of a hip replacement include the cup, which goes in the pelvis, goes in the socket side, and this is made of titanium. The titanium goes directly into the bone, and the body grows onto the titanium cup so that it is securely fixed. We'll often use screws that go through the cup into the pelvis in order to get good initial fixation while things are, are still healing. The liner, which is the white portion on the diagram, is typically made of polyethylene, which is a specialized type of plastic. And that liner clips into the cup and makes up the top half of the joint. The polyethylene makes the top half, which is the actual gliding surface of the new joint after it's been replaced. I've got a line on the diagram which separates that from the bottom half of the hip replacement. And the two parts on the bottom half are the head, which makes up the gliding surface on the other side of the joint. And this is made of either cobalt chromium, which is a type of metal, which is quite smooth, or ceramic is the other option, which is gaining more popularity and has been shown to be smoother than the cobalt chromium. The idea is that using ceramic has better wear properties. And this is what I'm using currently for almost all patients. The stem, which goes down the center of the femur, the thigh bone, is most often made up of titanium. Again, there are a few other options, but uh, titanium stems are the most common currently. In order to do the, res the hip replacement surgery, we have to remove the arthritic cartilage. So in the diagram, it shows a saw removing the ball portion, the femoral head, in order to make room for the stem to go down on the side of the femur. 
And then on the other picture on the right, there's a reamer, which is the instrument that we use that's textured and makes uh, an indentation in the pelvis and the socket side in order to accommodate the cup that's the correct size and shape. So again, the cup goes into the pelvis and is fixed securely, sometimes with screws. The stem goes down the center of the femur bone and the head is attached on top of that. Uncemented parts are most common in North America. However, in some instances, we will use cemented parts where the stem is cemented into the femur. The diagram shows multiple different texturing options that will be seen on different stems from different manufacturers that the body then grows onto in order for the stem and the cup to both become securely fixed into the bone. Moving on next to knee replacement surgery, we've got the cartoon diagrams. On the left we see before the arthritic knee where the cartilage is worn out and the bone is exposed. And then the after scenario where we've removed the arthritic bone and cartilage and replaced things with metal and polyethylene plastic components. Moving again through the components one by one, on the left on the top we see the femoral component which goes on the end of the thigh bone and this is made of the cobalt chromium material that the head of the femur is often made of in the other scenario. The bottom half of the joint is made up of the liner, which again is made up of polyethylene plastic, similar to what we commonly see in a hip replacement, and that clips securely into the tibial component, which is placed in the top of the tibia or the shin bone, and this is made of titanium. In many cases, the back of the kneecap, the patella, is also resurfaced. And when this is done, it's done with a, a polyethylene plastic uh, component that goes behind the kneecap. This diagram shows the surfaces of the knee after the cuts have been performed. Up on the top left, you can see the end of the femur bone where five cuts have been performed that are in the perfect size and shape to accommodate the femoral component, which rests in like a cap on the end of the femur. Then on the bottom we see the tibia where a flat cut has been made in order to accommodate the tibial tray and that smooth plastic polyethylene liner. And then in the upper right we see the patella which you can't really see the cut but a cut has been made in order to accommodate the uh, patella resurfacing. In the case of knee replacement, the metal parts are most commonly fixed to the bone using bone cement which gives very good initial security. However, it is important to note that uncemented parts are becoming more popular uh, more recently. Total knee replacement is more common than partial knee replacement. So on the left we see a total knee replacement where both the medial, the inside, and the lateral, the outside of the knee joint have been replaced. On the right we see the unicompartmental or partial knee replacement where only the inside or medial portion have been replaced, which is the most common configuration. However, sometimes if things wear out on the outside, the lateral of the uh, side of the joint, the partial knee replacement is performed on that side. Partial knee replacement is an option if only part of the knee is affected by arthritis and people only have pain that's localized to that specific area. In the instance where the arthritis is more widespread, total knee replacement is recommended. Now, it is important for people to understand that there are potential complications of surgery. The complications are part of the reason why we stress the need for non-operative treatment in order to make sure that we have tried everything necessary before moving ahead with joint replacement so that we can assure ourselves that we've done everything that we can to reasonably avoid surgery and then uh, as mentioned before, once things become significant enough and we're proceeding with surgery that, uh, that these risks that potentially could occur uh, are warranted. So moving from the top to the bottom, people can have reac reactions related to the anesthetic and medications they're given in and around the time of surgery. Surgery is a stress on the body, so medical issues can arise such as heart attack, stroke, or exacerbation of other chronic medical conditions. Next, I've put infection in bold. This is one of the complications that's directly related to joint replacement surgery that it's particularly difficult and problematic to treat. It is relatively rare at less than 1% for most individuals with normal risks. However, uh, as mentioned, it is very difficult to treat and we will go through this in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. 
bleeding can occur and there can be the potential need for blood transfusion. Patients can get blood clots after surgery that involves the leg, which can both occur in the leg or travel to the lungs and potentially be life-threatening. There is the potential for injury to other structures in the area, including nerves, tendons, or blood vessels. Fractures of the bone can occur either during the time of surgery or afterwards if patients have a fall or significant injury, and these could be more difficult to treat than if we didn't do a joint replacement in the first place. There are some complications related directly to hip replacement, which we'll discuss first. The first of which is dislocation, where the ball and the socket become disengaged, which is very painful and requires the hip to be put back into place in the emergency department. In cases where this becomes a recurrent issue or happens more than once, we start thinking about redo surgery in order to get things more stable. Sometimes the leg length can be affected in hip replacement and in certain instances, in order to get the hip stable, we have to use parts of a bigger size or geometry, and this can affect the overall leg lengths at the end of things. Complications that are more specific to knee replacement include stiffness, dislocation of the kneecap, or instability if the ligaments wear out or are damaged later on down the road. Again, infection warrants further discussion because it is one of the more difficult problems to treat that we encounter after joint replacement. Infection can occur in two basic time frames, one of which is soon after the surgery, and this can occur if bacteria get into the wound or onto the prosthesis at the time that the surgery is performed, or if people have wound healing issues, there's prolonged drainage, bacteria can get into the incision afterwards and cause an infection. In the other scenario, infection can occur long after surgery, and this occurs when bacteria enter the bloodstream and get to the joint in that fashion from another source. This includes infection elsewhere in the body, such as infections involving the skin, respiratory tract infections like pneumonia, or urinary tract infections. Additionally, procedures, medical procedures or dental procedures, where uh, instruments are being used in the mouth or elsewhere can cause bacteria to enter the bloodstream and again can cause a risk for infection. Signs of infection include prolonged drainage after the time of the initial surgery. There can be pus, either draining from the incision or somewhere else near the joint that's affected. Redness is common. It's typically quite painful when uh, hip or knee replacement gets infected. However, in some cases, symptoms can be more subtle. Patients can become quite sick from these infections with symptoms including fever, chills. Um, now, when we're talking about treatment of infection. Uh, the treatment can be quite involved and almost always requires additional surgery. If we catch things soon after the infection is established, sometimes we can leave the well-fixed parts that are fixed to the bone in place and just uh, replace the more easily changed out parts. However, more frequently, we have to take out all of the parts and do another surgery after the infection has been cured in order to come back and put a more functional joint replacement in. If there's infection, it does require a long, usually greater than six-week course of IV antibiotics. And the risk factors in the diagram on the right, there are multiple, but the major ones are obesity, which is modifiable. Patients who can lose weight or who have an elevated weight before surgery can reduce their risk by losing weight. Patients with diabetes are at higher risk, and we know that having better control of blood sugar does decrease these patients' risk of developing infection. Patients who are smokers have a higher risk, and by quitting can also reduce their risk. And then patients who are otherwise immunocompromised are at higher risk. In some cases, there are things that can be done to modify that. So again, to reduce the risk of complications after hip and knee replacement surgery, if you can lose weight or have an elevated weight, then weight loss does decrease the risk of running into trouble. Patients who are smokers should quit. Patients who have diabetes should try and gain good control of their diabetes. And after joint replacement surgery, we do recommend the use of antibiotics in order to help reduce the risk of developing infection. However, that is somewhat controversial. Patients often ask me what the recovery looks like after joint replacement. And this is a general timeline. It should be noted that every patient is individual. The amount of pain that they experience is individual. And some people will progress more quickly or slowly after a surgery. 
in general, immediately after surgery, the pain is greatest for the first two to three days. We do want patients starting physical therapy as soon as possible, and it is safe after first time hip or knee replacement surgery to put full weight on the leg in almost all cases. Typically by the six week time point, most patients have pain that's similar to or better than they did before surgery, so the majority of the recovery occurs in that first six weeks. Oftentimes patients are able to get back to driving, get back to working in a safe manner at about the six week time point. And then at three months, patients occasionally will have some degree of minimal pain, will have resumed most of their regular activities and will be feeling pretty good after their surgery. That's not to say that patients who have some discomfort or pain at that time point should get discouraged because we can see some subtle improvements that can be expected up to a year after surgery. Now looking at outcomes, Hip replacement outcomes are in general very good and patients who've had a hip replacement have very, very high satisfaction rates, as high as 98%. In general, if patients don't have a complication, they're generally very happy. With knee replacement, patients are more likely to have some residual pain. About 15% of patients will have some pain following a knee replacement, which may be related to pain coming from soft tissues, pain coming that's referred from other sources such as the hip, back or elsewhere that uh, may be the cause of this. And in addition, the hip is, or the knee rather, is a more complicated joint and some patients will just find that the knee doesn't feel quite the same as the knee that they were born with. And this is potentially the reason why the satisfaction rates are not quite as good, 85% still uh, very good and almost all patients will find that they have a pretty dramatic reduction in the amount of pain that they experience, but patients sometimes will find that things are not perfect. So what activities are safe after joint replacement? In general, I tell patients that it is safer to get back to low impact activities, and this avoids excessive wear of the replacement parts. Now patients can still be active, and we do want them to be active. Um, different surgeons will have somewhat different philosophies as to you know, getting back to running, jogging, things of that nature. However, it should be taken into consideration this may affect the longevity of the replacement. Some activities are going to put patients at a higher risk of fracture, so contact sports or patients who want to get back to skiing, uh, if they do have a fall or a significant injury, can have a fracture. Patients will often ask how long a joint replacement can be expected to last, and if you ask most orthopedic surgeons, they'll say in the range of 15 to 20 years. Now with the newer generation plastic polyethylene, we have seen improvements in wear properties and these parts haven't been out for the full 20 years. So we may very well see longer uh, longevity in many patients than that 20 year time frame. Another way to look at the numbers would be to say that the annual failure rates are about 0.5 to 1%. So in general terms, there's a 90 to 95% chance that a joint replacement will last you 10 years and an 80 to 85% chance that it will last you 20 years. For many of our patients, they'll have a, a good, well-functioning joint replacement for the rest of their life. So what are the outcomes after revision or redo joint replacement surgery? In general, redo joint replacement is associated with longer hospital stays, higher expense, both looking at the patient as well as the payer, and poor patient reported outcomes in the long term. So in summary, hip and knee replacement surgery is performed for pain that's due to arthritis when non-operative treatment uh, strategies have failed. Both of these surgeries, hip and knee replacement, provide reliable pain relief. There are no age limits, although we do uh, worry somewhat with younger, age pa er, younger patients that they could wear the joint replacement out in their lifetime and need redo surgery. Again, with older patients, uh, we do have to take into consideration patients' um, medical conditions, what their risk is, but for debilitating pain, there is no age limit. Complications of joint replacement surgery are relatively rare, but can be serious if they occur. Many people will have some degree of arthritis and never need surgery. They can maintain a reasonable quality of life. So even though arthritis is very common, not everybody with a diagnosis of arthritis necessarily has to have their joint replaced. There is rarely harm in delaying joint replacement if you can maintain an acceptable quality of life.
So again, things are going to vary somewhat from patient to patient. However, in the literature, the research that's been done shows us that patients will recover somewhat quicker from a partial knee replacement compared to a total knee replacement. Again, it is important to take into consideration that only certain patients will be candidates for partial knee replacement if only a part of the knee is worn out and the rest of the cartilage is free of arthritis and patients are free of pain elsewhere in the knee. So in the immediate post-operative time period, things will vary a little bit by surgeon, but usually we'll see people at two weeks, six weeks, and then three months out from surgery in order to make sure that things are going well. For patients with a well-functioning joint replacement, typically we'll see them back at every year to two year intervals in order to get x-rays, make sure that things are doing well. If patients have problems or pain after a joint replacement, we do want to see people sooner in order to ensure that there isn't something problematic that's going on or that needs to be addressed. Well, again, it depends a little bit on the surgeon, the patient, and uh, how those things fit together. In patients who are healthier and need both hips replaced, it is possible to do things closer together. In general, we like people to be getting around reasonably well, have their pain reasonably well controlled, and um, that they can adequately do the rehabilitation following the second joint replacement and that they'll be getting around well enough in order to cope with things. So in general I would wait about six weeks but there are many surgeons who may proceed sooner than that. There are some who may uh, recommend waiting longer. Arthritis to some degree is genetic in nature so when patients have arthritis of one hip, one knee, or other joints in the body, they are potentially at higher risk for having arthritis in the other joints. So it's not entirely uncommon for us to see patients who need both hips and both knees replaced. So there are several non-operative management strategies, and we discussed those things a little bit earlier, but keeping the weight under reasonable control, seeing a dietitian in order to do that can be very helpful. Patients should keep active. We want to keep people moving, so physical therapy in order to maintain strength, range of motion. There are pain control strategies, things like Tylenol, Advil. In cases where people are really uh, not surgical candidates or uh, are really interested in avoiding surgery, sometimes pain management specialists can help us out in this regard. And then there are a few different kinds of injections, both the cortisone injections for the hip and knee, the visco supplement or the gel injections for the knee are a potential option. And oftentimes this can give patients good pain relief and can prolong or avoid the need for hip or knee replacement surgery. So we do have occupational and physical therapists on our team who will meet with patients and talk to them in advance in order to figure out strategies for making it easier to get around for patients after surgery. This includes things like raised toilet seats, bars in order to help patients get up, ensuring that they have higher seating that's available, taking into consideration stairs or other things that can be done in order to make it easier for either patients to sleep and manage on the main level for a period of time. It can be helpful to have a family member or other individual around who can help you after the time of surgery. And in addition, it can help to make sure that physically you're in the best shape that you can be. So making sure that medical issues are optimized, that the leg in question is as strong as it can be with physical therapy, uh, and that helps patients to get around, mobilize well after surgery. Additionally, if patients are on narcotic pain medications, getting off of those is very helpful because we know that patients who are tolerant to those medications are less effective after surgery and pain control is more problematic. Again, the trend, and this was occurring even before COVID was an issue that we had to contend with, was to decrease the amount of stay in hospital. There had been a lot of research in this area and we found that for the majority of patients, it is safe to go home as soon as the same day provided that patients can get around safely, that the pain is under reasonable control, and that their medical status uh, allows for that to happen. So same-day surgery is an option, theoretically, for many of our patients. 
Other people will stay one night in hospital, and that's probably the more typical scenario. However, in other circumstances, if pain is problematic, if patients are having difficulty getting around safely, or if there's other medical conditions that pop up around the time of surgery, that stay can be prolonged. So there have been many research studies that have shown that both robotic and navigated knee replacements, that the parts are put in straighter and more consistently. What the studies haven't been able to show is that it makes much of a difference in terms of longevity of the parts or the outcomes after surgery. So we know that we're putting the parts in straighter when we use these technologies, but it still hasn't really significantly affected that 15% of people who are not entirely happy after knee replacement. We don't really know why that is. With regards to the minimally invasive approaches, there are multiple that have been described for the knee. Now, in general, these approaches give less access, less visualization, and make it more difficult for the surgeon to put in parts that are of appropriate size and in an appropriate position. So although some people will do these approaches with the thought that it might decrease the initial recovery, um, it is still somewhat controversial. So the goal for total knee replacement is to get the knee all the way straight. Patients who have stiffness before surgery have sometimes more difficulty getting full range of motion afterwards, so all the way straight to about 120 degrees is typical. Now, again, if patients have a contracture or can't flex the knee past 90 degrees prior to surgery, those patients are at higher risk for stiffness afterwards. If patients have a lot of pain and aren't able to do the physical therapy or aren't diligent with the exercises, stiffness can be problematic afterwards as well. It is quite difficult if patients don't get the range of motion back within the first two to three months, uh, difficult to get things back after that specific time point. So in general, keeping active is good. In general, lower impact things are, are better for the knee, especially when people start to have some early wear and tear. But going to the gym, getting on a stationary bike, the elliptical, um, those are all very good things. Walking, hiking is relatively low impact. And to some degree, lifting weights, as long as it's done in a supervised fashion, people know what they're doing, uh, that can also be helpful in order to, to maintain strength. As people get more and more arthritis, that may become less and less of a, a possibility for them. Right, so again, there's a little bit of controversy as far as this goes. What we do know is that the best approach is the one that your surgeon is comfortable with. So if your surgeon doesn't do direct anterior approach, then they probably shouldn't be doing it for one patient or, or starting. We do know that the complication rates with that approach or with any approach are higher initially getting started off. We do know that for certain patients, the access to the femur is very difficult with the anterior approach. And in the instances where we have to do redo surgery, again, through the anterior approach, things are very difficult. There's been a lot of research in this area because, again, we're going between the muscles with the anterior approach, that people feel that it's less invasive. There has been some uh, evidence that the early recovery is somewhat quicker. However, these changes are not drastic. It's still a big surgery, regardless of which approach is used. And the majority of the literature also says that in the long term, there's no difference based on the anterior, lateral, or posterior approach. So a lot of it's based on what your surgeon is comfortable with. If you have a very specific preference as far as that goes, it probably makes sense to find a surgeon who does that approach if it's important to you. So there actually is a good amount of literature that says staying active is not harmful to a joint once you've got arthritis. Sometimes people can overdo things, so when we avo uh, recommend avoidance of higher impact things, if you go out and jog or run and you've got some arthritis in the knee, you're going to pay for it at the end of the day or the next day. 
what it doesn't appear, though, is that that causes the knee or hip to wear out more quickly or will require you to, ha you to have surgery more quickly. So if we can control things with Tylenol and keep people reasonably active and consistent with their activity level, we're not causing damage by masking the pain or by uh, allowing patients to be more active in the meanwhile. Well, the, the short answer is no, that things should not be moving. Typically, that's going to be something that's associated with pain. Certain types of cemented implants can shift a tiny amount after the initial implantation. However, in general, things should be stable and should not move in terms of the well-fixed parts. Well, again, that's quite variable. It depends a little bit on pain control. Obviously, when patients are taking narcotic pain medications, they're not going to be able to function well. And when patients are having pain, they're not going to be, be able to focus on tasks, even for desk jobs that are going to be necessary to go back to full-time work. So again, this is very variable. Patients who are more motivated, who do better in terms of pain, can get back more quickly. But I tell most patients to expect about six weeks after surgery before they're feeling good and able to go back to full-time work.